and welcome back. In a nation that still has a moderately free press, I wanted to bring you guys this article. As China eradicates memories of Tiananmen Square, globalists work toward world censorship. Today, China's state-run media is completely ignoring the massacre, which claimed the lives of several hundred, and Chinese censors are even blocking out foreign newscasts reporting on the anniversary. So if you guys aren't too up on the 25th anniversary of Tiananmen Square, let's take a look at some of the factoids of it. This is back in 1989, and it was uh, for various reasons. Not everybody was out there for the exact same reason, but some of the reasons include economic reform, inflation, political corruption. So you have many students out there uh, peaceful protesting for the large part. And then, you know, things start to get a little dicey. The, uh, the military is called in to squash the protest. So, you know, th conflicts happen, people get injured. So the military, uh, the big wigs of the military, they say, we don't want our troops to become sympathetic with the protesters, all these, uh, these students out here. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring in a different set of troops that speak a different version of the Chinese language to come in and beat up on the protesters, to brutalize the protesters that way. So when the protesters yell at them, they won't be sympathetic because they won't understand what they're saying. And if you say this is, uh, this is completely crazy, this happens every year in the United States of America. That's why they bring foreign troops here to train. They do it every year in Florida. They did it just a couple weeks ago or a month or so ago. Uh, in Florida, bringing these foreign troops in, and everybody stands there and they clap and say, oh, isn't it so cool, they're shooting machine guns in the harbor or whatever. I'm like, these people are training to kill you. They're not training in some desert scenario to go fight somebody in Iraq or Afghanistan. They're training in a U.S. city to take over a U.S. city. But that's here or there. Let's focus on Tiananmen Square. Let's show you the very famous tank video. And I'm sure many of you guys have seen this before, but take a look at this. This is the footage I've actually never seen uh, until today. This is the gentleman standing in front of the tank, actually climbing on top of the tank. Now, they don't show you this in the state-run media because they don't want you to know that you have power, just like this guy does. He gets on the tank. He's looking in the, in the portholes. He's yelling at the guys. He's like, hey, man, come out. He said, hey, the answer to 1984, 1776, bud. And the guy comes out there, he says, hey, man, we don't like all that freedom out here. You better get on, boy. He said, no, nah, man, I, I'm about my freedom. What you want to do? And this is, what you, this is the kind of attitude that you have to have, not just there in Tiananmen Square, but here in the United States of America, because you guys recall the Bundy Ranch. This is where free people, free patriots, gather together in support of Clive and Bundy, not just in support of Clive and Bundy, but just the notion that you could own your own private property, have your cattle grazed on land, and not have to pay a bunch of fees to a bunch of bureaucrats who come out there with their guns and with their armored vehicles and come out there and bug their eyes out at you. But if you do the same, if you show up on a horse with a little six shooter on your hip, oh, now you're a terrorist. Now you're a domestic threat. Now Harry Reason will get up there and talk about you and that you're nothing but a domestic terrorist. No, you're not a terrorist. You're a patriot, just like this guy. He says, no, I don't want your tanks out here. The people at the Bundy Ranch said, no, we don't want your police state here. Leave us alone. We're going to be out here in peace. So whether it's Tiananmen Square in 1989 or the Bundy Ranch in 2014, you have to continue to fight for your rights. And that's what we'll do right after this break when Rob Dew talks to an advocate of industrial hemp. Stay tuned. This is the InfoWars Nightly News. Welcome back to the InfoWars Nightly News. Our next guest has been fighting for the legalization uh, for hemp manufacturing and growing here in the United States since the late 90s. His name is Eric Pollitt. He is head of Global Hemp Incorporated and uh, also the website globalhemp.com. And he recently helped author HB 5085, which is the Illinois Hemp Research Bill. And he joins us to tell us about that and other aspects and ways that we could get hemp grown in the United States because there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to grow something that has no THC in it that could get you high and can be used for many other things. And without further ado, let's bring him in here. How's it going today, Eric? It's going great. Thanks for having me on, Rob. Great. So tell us a little bit about this bill, uh, how it got through and, and your other efforts. You, you were, you've been doing this since the uh, early 2000s trying to get a bill introduced and now you finally had some success. So take it away. Yeah, 1998, 1999, there were two different uh, research bills here in Illinois, and both of them passed uh, the House and the Senate, uh, but Governor Ryan at the time vetoed both of them. And uh, after that happened, basically that was it. Uh, there were several states that were doing legislation, uh, with North Dakota being the first state. Uh, but also, most of the legislation during that time uh, would have been for research, uh, but it was following the federal laws. Uh, that, that require uh, researchers to get a permit from the DEA. 
And the problem is, is the DEA will not give anyone a permit, uh, save the one that they did give to Dr. David West, who did a research in Hawaii. Uh, so fast forward to today, uh, the bill that I helped uh, co-author, which was uh, HB 5085, it originally started off as a licensing uh, that would allow farmers to grow it, although the federal level doesn't allow for it. Um, but it was shot down by the Illinois Department of Agriculture, not because they were against hemp by any means whatsoever at all. It just was a, a, a funding issue. So the bill was rewritten to be a research bill, which coincides very well with the, the farm bill that was passed this year. Uh, and the farm bill uh, allows, it, it, first of all, it makes the distinction in the language uh, that hemp and marijuana are not the same, that hemp is what it is. Uh, it's a low THC variety of cannabis, and it has lots of uses. Um, and then what, what, what the, the farm bill did in addition to that is that it allows uh, universities and state departments of agriculture to do research on hemp uh, as long as the state has uh, a hemp research or, or, or hemp legislation in place. And presently, there are be between 13 and 16 states that do allow for that. Um, and then the final thing is, the real biggie, is that no DEA permit is required. Right, so we don't have to get permission from our federal masters just, just to start growing a plant. Well, the, 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 the folks in Kentucky just ran into a problem, is, is that uh, they had legislation already in place last year, they had eight research projects lined up, and they imported hemp seed from Italy into Chicago, and U.S. Customs looked at it and said, hey, wait a minute, this is viable hemp seed. It will sprout and grow into a plant. Uh, importing hemp seed that's sterilized, such as from Canada, is fine. Uh, so they called the uh, uh, Kentucky Agricultural Commissioner, and he said, hey, look, you know, this is fine. Look at the farm bill. So they sent it down to, to Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, and that's where the DEA got involved with customs, and there's a legal battle that happened for uh, approximately three weeks. And as of last week, uh, that hemp is actually in the ground right now as we speak. Uh, and the problem is, is the DEA said, hey, you need a Controlled Substance Act permit. And they said, uh, look at the Farm Bill. The Farm Bill says no, no DEA permit required. Uh, so, you know, as I joke, it's kind of like the, the cartoon of the stork eating the the, the frog and the frog sitting there, you know, choking on the stork's throat, you know, trying to get that last bit. You know, they don't want to give up that easily. And uh, fortunately, Kentucky has now paved the way for the rest of the states that want to continue with hemp research. Well, that sounds good. And you actually, on your website, you posted a map uh, that of the 50 states, and it has green for the states that are ready to start growing hemp, blue for the states that aren't and then gray for the ones who are kind of in a gray area. Tell us a little bit about this map and why is it that the southern states, the areas where you could grow hemp year round, aren't interested in growing this product, it seems? Well, uh, the one thing I look at is even here in Illinois, uh, when, when they were asked questions about, you know, uh, such as the, the legislator that, 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 that did this bill uh, wasn't really for hemp before. Uh, and the thing is, is any hemp legislation before this farm bill that passed this year uh, it was really just ceremonial. It's been a very grassroots. It's been a very, uh, it, it's protesting to the federal government. Hey, look, you know, we want the chance to grow hemp, but federal law supersedes state law. So it's kind of the state's rights. It's, it's really been a state's rights issue. It's been a grassroots issue. Uh, and several states uh, have passed legislation, uh, and it's been ceremonial more than anything else. Uh, but you are correct when you look at the map and you coincide that, the cotton producing states, such as Texas, uh, have not passed any legislation. However, California has. Uh, so, but the problem is, is, is that, you know, they're, they're in, there's a drought problem with actually both of those states. Right. And you were telling me earlier about uh, an issue, I guess you're calling it peak cotton. Uh, explain to people what that is. It's not like we're running out of cotton. It's not like it won't grow out of the ground, but where you can grow it, there's, there's a problem. Right. Yeah, there's a term that, that, that I kind of coined. Uh, I haven't heard it before, uh, but I call it peak cotton. And what that, that is is that cotton is grown everywhere in the world where it will grow. Uh, India, China, Egypt, uh, the southern United States. Uh, and the thing is, is that as the developing nations get a higher standard of living, there's two things that regardless of the religion or the language or anything else, there's two things that people do once they start having a little bit of extra money in their pocket. Number one, they like to eat meat. Number two, they like to have more clothing. And the thing is, is that there's only a certain amount of land 
that cotton can be grown on. And so you run into the problem that uh, until just in the last 10 years, cotton had upwards to a 90 percent uh, uh, market share of clothing. However, now it's dropped down uh, market share wise, but not volume wise. And what that means is, is that more and more people are buying more clothing, but they have to substitute another fiber. Uh, so what they've done is, is they've been using polyester in the last 10 years. And so synthetic uh, has gone up quite a bit uh, because, like I said, people in developing nations, they want to go from having, say, five shirts to having 30 shirts in their wardrobe. And so cotton can't be grown in Illinois, for example. Uh, so what would happen is, is uh, once we have the hemp processing technology down to have a better textile that can be spun on cotton equipment, and it, it will complement cotton. We're not by any means looking at competing against cotton. What we want to do is be a complement, another natural fiber that's very similar to cotton and can be blended with cotton. And what we want to do is to get rid of uh, uh, so many synthetic fibers because people do people do like cotton. It's just there, there, there's a finite amount of the resource available. Right. And uh, I was reading also in one of your articles that retail, just as retail sales of hemp products exceeds uh, $580 million. So this is obviously a huge market that we could bring to the United States and bring jobs to people. In addition to growing it, you have the manufacturing process and, and those type of deals that can, that can be brought about. What are the different uses of hemp? You know, people know about the paper and the clothing, but what are some other uses out there that can be used with this product? Yeah, if you look at hemp in general, it can be split into two different, different crops. You have the seed crop and you have a fiber crop. Uh, so Canada grows primarily seed crop, and the seeds go into uh, different foods. Uh, so they can, take, they can get rid of the shell and they have what's called hemp hearts. Uh, or they can uh, 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 take the seed and press it for oil. And they also have a protein powder. And those are all, the majority are organic foods. Uh, and on the side of fiber... Fiber is quite a bit different, with the low end being uh, paper but, and the high end being textiles. But uh, in between the two, you have composite grade. And what they're doing is, is that Mercedes-Benz actually pioneered the research back in the late 1980s because Germany has, uh, I think it's 80 million people, but it's in, a, it's in an area about the, the size of Montana. Uh, and what they did is Germany uh, said, hey, we've, we've built the last landfill. And they said, we can't just keep throwing all this stuff in the landfill. So there's never been a problem with uh, recycling the metal of a car. But the problem is, is the interior, you know, the dashboards, all that kind of stuff. And uh, also to increase the fuel mileage, uh, what, they, what they did is they came up with a matting material that's 50% polypropylene, which is a plastic, and 50% natural fiber uh, with, with hemp, flax, and canaf being the top three vast fibers that are used for that purpose. And what they do is, number one, it's less expensive for the company, so that's a positive thing. Number two, there's less wear and tear on the machinery when they mold the parts. It's better for the workers, uh, and then it gets the, the equivalent of the EPA off the company's backs, uh, and it's a recyclable material at the end of its life. And like I said earlier, it's a lighter weight material, so uh, if, you, if you can decrease the weight of the car by you know 20 pounds, everything counts. Uh, in doing that. And the composite markets are huge. Uh, with plastics, plastics in general are the third largest industry in the United States after automobiles and steel. So plastics are huge. There's a huge growth potential for it. And uh, it, it, plastics are dependent on the price of petroleum. We know that the price of petroleum is, is, is significantly higher now than it was uh, before Hurricane Trink, Katrina. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a growing demand throughout the world for more and more petroleum, so we don't really see the price going down. Uh, so what they do is they use the hemp fiber uh, kind of as a uh, reinforcement, kind of like rebar and concrete. And the hemp fiber is very strong, uh, and that's what allows for uh, when you're sitting in your car and you, and you can put your elbow uh, on, the, on the car door panel, there's a 90-degree angle there. And, and only hemp and flax can really do that. So there's a company in northern Indiana, Elkhart, uh, in Elkhart, Indiana, called Flexform Technologies. And they produce that matting material. But presently, they're importing all the hemp fiber uh, from Europe. And they use actually more canaf, which is a subtropical crop uh, related to okra and cotton. And so it doesn't really grow in the United States that well. And they bring in all the canaf from Southeast Asia. Uh, and, and, and the thing is, is if we grow hemp in the United States, uh, it really 
is a bulky 